Well, good morning, everybody. I want to talk to you this morning about the beating heart. When I'm talking about the beating heart, I'm not talking about your natural heart. I'm talking about the beating heart of what it is to have faith in Jesus Christ. What it is to have faith in God. And I think it's very important, the heart. You know, you see it throughout Scripture. There are very many different uh, meanings hidden behind it. There is the, the physical meaning as to the thing that's in your chest. There's also the, the, the idea that all thoughts in the Bible come from the heart. Uh, there's the idea as well that the heart is the place of morality within a person. And then the other thought, which we still carry through today, was the idea of the actual fact that love comes from the heart. Hate comes from the heart, the attitude, the emotions. Uh, but the most beautiful thing that I want to talk to you about today, when we're talking about the heart, is we're talking about the spirit that dwells inside your inner man, your inner person. And we're not talking spirit with a big S, we're talking spirit with a little s. But that your spirit is integral to your relationship with God. Now, if I was to liken it to the human body, it would be like the platelets, the red platelets in your blood system. And I know as somebody who used to be a smoker that the reality was is that you can damage yourself through smoking because what happens in your blood is rather than the platelets taking oxygen on board, they take on carbon monoxide from the smoking. And this is fed around your body and it builds up and there's this process of stuff which comes which is called atherin and blocks up your arteries and clogs up your lungs and does all these things to take the life out of your body. Because your body is more attracted to carbon monoxide than it is to oxygen. And when you live in a fallen world, the reality is, is that sometimes your body is more attracted to evil than it is to good. It's easier to digest. It's easier to embrace. I mean, the reality is, is you look out there, it's everywhere. I mean, C.S. Lewis, he says this, he says, It is safe to tell the pure of heart that they shall see God, for only the pure of heart want to. This is the reality of the life that we live. You know, unless you're pure of heart, you don't want to know who God is. You're quite content with your life the way it is, because you can act the way you want, you can be who you want to be, without having any accountability to anybody other than yourself. And your heart attitude and principles. But when we're talking about the beating heart of faith, we're talking about a rhythm which is perfected by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Because your little s spirit is connected to another spirit. And that can either be the spirit of the world or it could be the spirit of God whom we've been baptized into because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And when we repented of our sins and when we were baptized, we were embraced into the family to have a relationship with God one-on-one, -on -one, but not just exclusively, as a people together. For we are not a body of Christ by ourselves as individuals, but as a community we become the body of Christ. And the heartbeat of that body is loving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. This is the greatest commandment that has ever existed. This is what the whole movement was for in the first place. The reason why Jesus came and he died and he lived on the earth was because he loved God with all his heart, with all his mind, with all his soul, and with all his strength. And the example that Jesus is setting us, we are to follow in that example. Loving God 
with everything that we've got. Every part of us loving Jesus, loving the Spirit, loving the Father. Nothing is excluded. Nothing should be held back. And only when we love God with such fullness and such completeness can we love each other as we love ourselves. You want to be selfless, you have to love God. You want to be perfect, you have to love God. You want to be close to who God's Spirit is, you have to love Him. He loves you. He poured out His life for you. He gave everything that he had. And in the scriptures, Mark 12, 28, we found a beautiful story where a man comes to challenge Jesus. But in the challenging of Jesus, the crowd is challenged back. Don't you love how Jesus operated? He wasn't afraid of the question. But the questioner had to beware because the question revealed the heart of the person. And he was able to see what the heart of the person was. So when the person asked the question, he asked another question back that hit right at the mark. There was no hiding or pretending that you were superior in the presence of Jesus Christ. Because he saw the hearts and minds of all mankind and those who spoke to him. Not because he in himself was able, but because he was in tandem with the person of the Holy Spirit. He did it through his humanity. He loved and he spoke because he loved God so much. And because of his love for God, he loved us so much. Just as he loved himself. Even so, to die on a cross was a great love. What man could do such more for a friend than to lay his life down? Such love. And here he is, and I, I just, every time I read the words of Jesus, I, 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 I think I, I just would love to give my right arm just to hear him preach once. No, in fact, actually, I'll give all my limbs if I could hear him preach. Imagine being there when he's speaking, when he's talking. Nobody speaks like him. Nobody talks like him. We talk about other preachers out there. We call them good preachers, prince of preachers. You know what? They don't compare to how he preached, how he taught. He captivated the hearts and minds of people, whether they were young or whether they were old, whether they were rich, whether they were poor, whether they were Jew, whether they were Gentile. He spoke with such clarity because he spoke the heart of God for the people. And the people were desiring to hear what God was saying. They were lapping it up. And here he is. He still had people who hated him, who still disputed with him. What is that reality? It shows their heart was not in the right place. They were not loving God. They were loving themselves. And when one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Now sometimes we don't like being told what to do. Sometimes we don't like rules and regulations and laws and all these different things. But the reality is this, is if God gave us no commandments, God would not love us. The Bible talks in Proverbs, it says, A good father disciplines his children, and that shows his love for them. If your father doesn't discipline you, if your parents don't discipline you, don't look after you, don't teach you to be a good person, the reality and the question has to be, do they really love you? Do they want the best for you? Now, a lot of parents out there, they want their children to be happy. But I want my children to be good. There's a difference between happiness and goodness. See, happiness is a selfish motive where you get what you want, when you want it, how you want it. And sometimes with children, you have to do it because they need to be fed when they need to be fed. But the reality is this, is that goodness takes something more than just fulfilling a need. It requires discipline. 
It requires the ability to follow after somebody else who's been in those shoes, learned, found the mistakes, and discerned what is good and what is wrong, and the benefit of doing what is good. So when God gives us commandments, he doesn't give us them because he wants you to do what he says, wipe his shoes, free bags full, all those type of things. No, he does it because he loves us. He cherishes us. He wants the best for us. So he has loads of commandments that we find in the scriptures. And that just shows how much God loves us. But the greatest... The most important, Jesus says, is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. No other commandment greater than these. Isn't it funny, you know, the guy came and he was asking the question and he only wanted to know the one commandment. But Jesus gave him a second. Why did Jesus give him the second commandment? He only asked for the one. What's the most important? The reality that was faced is that these two commandments are so inextricably linked that it's dangerous to separate them. You can't love God if you don't love your fellow man. And equally, you can't love your fellow man if you don't love God. Because why? Why is this? Because mankind... Humanity is made in the image of God. And so if you destroy one, you're destroying the other. You attack humanity, you're attacking God's image. Even if it's a fallen image, there's something which identifies with the Creator. And that's why Jesus fed it back. All of a sudden, all those leaders who've been disputing and criticizing Jesus and had the attitude against him and trying to trip him up, all of a sudden they're convicted because the reality is, is that they've been attacking their fellow neighbor. And yet they've been boasting about how much they love God. Got caught out. Hit it right at the heart. But I love this factor here when he talks about love. It's more than just the emotion. It's not an emotional love by itself. Because he talks about all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Now we know that the soul is linked to the emotion. It's linked to the personality of a human being. Your character. Your nature. We know that the mind is linked to your ability to reason. To rationale. And we know that the strength is to do with your works and your acts and your physical body. And the outward working. But the heart is speaking about the spirit of a person. That which can align with the good and the bad. That which is your will. That which is your morality. All these things need to express love. It's greater than just the emotional idea of love between a man and a woman, which is eros. It's greater than the love between a friend, which is philo. It's talking about agape love, which is a God love. It's a love not based on condition. It's unconditional. It's a love that needs nothing to go before it for it to happen. God loved the world. He sent his only son. Whether the world chooses to follow after God or to repent, it doesn't matter. He loves. 
he expressed. Even if nobody repented and gone to the cross, God has to love, he has to express himself and his own repentance of that love. He doesn't take back the cross. He doesn't take back the issue that went before because he still loves. He still cares. And God is calling us to love the way that he loves to him and to one another unconditionally. And whoa, the silence in the room. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. It's not about the ritual of your Christian faith. It's not about the regularity of your Christian faith. It's not about the sacrifices that you make for God. It's not about the obedience that you make for God. What is it about? It's about the love that you have for God and the innermost being of your heart. You strip everything else away and you still love him. It's not about what he does for you. It's not about whether he makes your life pleasant. It's not about whether he answers your prayers. It's not about why, whether he smotes your enemies. It's not about whether he gives you a nice car to drive or whether you have a good job or whether you look pretty or whether you look ugly or whether you've got people who hate you or people who love you. It's not this factor. The factor is that you would love God regardless. Even whether you were being put on a stake and being burnt alive, you would confess your love for him till your dying breath as your flesh is burning and all other people are accusing you. Because you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that his love is eternal. It goes beyond this life. It goes into the next. He has risen from the dead and he has risen so that you might rise from the dead. That you may come into the fullness of what God has for you. Instead of looking at all the things that what everybody else has. God wants you to focus on him and him alone. Don't be concerned with the busyness of this world. For this world will fade away. This world is not eternal. This place is not eternal. Your friends are not eternal. Your enemies are not eternal. Your children are not eternal. Your parents are not eternal. Your friendships, your job, your life. But his love is eternal. For Paul talks in his scripture, he says, the gifts will fade away, but love will endure. It will last forever. Is your heart beating for his love? You know, the other, or well, last night I was lying in my bed and I was having a nightmare. And as you do when you have a nightmare, you have paralysis. I'm so glad I did have paralysis, otherwise I would have beaten up my wife next to me because I'm fighting in this dream, but my arms and my legs aren't moving. But I can feel my brain is on fire, and as I'm feeling my brain is on fire, my heart is pounding in my chest. I've not got paralysis of the heart. If you had paralysis of the heart, that would be fatal. And some people, they, they don't wake up from their dreams because their heart stops. But here is the reality. God wants the stability of the heart in our lives. Whatever condition we find ourselves, that it keeps beating for him. Keeps loving for him. Keeps longing for him. God wants us to love, not hate. He wants us to embrace, not disown. His will and no one else's will. This is a beautiful text that Jesus does. 
Because when he comes back, he saw that the wise man, he'd answered wisely. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. You're not far from the kingdom of God. If your heart is beating for him, and it is a priority that your inner self loves him with all of it, then you're close to the kingdom of God. You're close. You're not far from the heavenly dimension and the heavenly realm. Some people ask the question, why don't we see more miracles? The reality is, where is our heart at? Where is our love at? Where is our compassion at? I love the fact that when you see Jesus moving with the miracles, it talks about this Greek word. I can't even pronounce it. Spugsnik something or other like that. It's, it talks about the gut, the compassion that he had. That when he was about to move in a miracle, something gripped him right here. He couldn't leave it alone. He had to reach out where others dared to reach. He was compelled. Because the love in him just overflowed towards his fellow man. You know, we can walk by sometimes when we see people on the streets. And think, oh, well, that's their fault. It's their issue. It's their problem. And sometimes we can safely say people, some people do deserve to be on the streets because of the choices that they made. But he loved them. He cared for them. He went out of his way to help others who would not even help themselves. Nobody dared to ask him any more questions. The scripture that Jesus quotes comes from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9. And in Israel, this is called the Shema. The reason why it's called the Shema is the first word that is used of this passage is here. It's the Hebrew for Shema. Or listen is another way of saying it. And it found in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And this is what Jesus quoted, but it goes on and it says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. I love the fact that you have to ask Jesus into your heart to be born again. It's not about what you look like on the inside. It's not about how you can keep God's law. It's about having an open heart to follow his Holy Spirit. Yes, the law is still important, but it's the law of the Spirit, not the law of the flesh. What do I mean between the law of the spirit and the law of the flesh? The reality is this. Is that the law of the spirit means that you walk in relationship with somebody who's holding your hand. Who guides you. Who comforts you. Who shows you a better way of life. Whereas the law of the flesh is about you trying to do it by yourself. I don't need nobody else. I got this sorted. You know, the times when I think that I've got to the place that I need to be, and I'm all of a sudden, wow, I've not done this in days, and then all of a sudden as I'm boasting about it, whoa, I've gone and done it. I've fallen into the trap. It's not an issue of pride. It's not an issue of whether you're big enough or whether you're strong enough. It's an issue of humility. Are you prepared to give the reins over to somebody who knows the way? I love the story of C.S. Lewis, the horse and his boy. And in the story of C.S. Lewis, the horse and his boy, the horse is the Holy Spirit. The boy is us. And it's talking about the relationship between the boy and the spirit. The power in the horse. Whereas the boy is powerless. And when he gets on the horse, the horse takes him to freedom. The horse gives him power that he doesn't have to overcome his enemies. Gives him power to travel where he could not travel in his own strength. And that is the relationship we have with the Spirit. He gives us the power, the ability. 
but it needs to be on our hearts. How do we love one another? How do we love each other? We need to teach diligently the same matters to those around us. To be reliant on the Spirit and not on your own strength and in your own flesh. It says later on in the scripture, it goes, You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as a frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates talking about phylacteries. They used to have little boxes where this scripture was written and put on their foreheads and tied to their foreheads when they prayed. It's also or on the hand so that they could see, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and your strength and your mind. And all these things were straight there to remind them. On the doorways as they walked through the houses, it would be written. When they got up in the morning, they would pray the same thing. When they went to bed in the evening, they would pray the same thing. When they were meeting with their friends and their families, they would encourage them in the same thing. And they even do this to this day, if you're a diligent Jew. The first thing you do when you wake up, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Last thing in the evening, the same thing. Repetition. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. Know it. Learn it. But God was asking not just for reputation. He was asking for it to be on your heart. Not just know it, live it. Experience it. Love it. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give to you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery." Sometimes we find that we can be like the soil, where the seed lands on the soil, but all of a sudden, the weeds grow up and choke it out. The cares and the worries and the concerns of life choke out our love for God. But equally, there's another time when things are going well. We've got everything that we need, everything that we want. And we forget who God is, what he's done, and how we are to love him. And it's in these times we need to remind ourselves even more so. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. A.W. Tozer says this, there is, it, there is within the heart, human heart a tough, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns my and mine look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. They express the real nature of man better than a thousand volumes could do. They are verbal symptoms of our deep disease. The roots of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one rootlet, lest we die. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God, and the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous substitution." We can become like Pharaoh. You know when he was in the situation and he was asked whether he was going to allow the Israelites out to go and worship God and he said no because I want them to worship me. What happened to Pharaoh? His heart went hardened. 
But equally, Ezekiel says this, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God wants us rooted not in this world, but rooted in him. To love him with all our hearts, all our minds, all our soul, and all our strength. Ecclesiastes 3.11, I want to close with this. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. The time that you are living in is beautiful. Don't let anybody else say that to you. Sometimes we can look at the times that we're living in and we become fearful. We can look at the ugliness. We can look at the pain. We can look at the suffering. But in God's eyes, the time we live in is beautiful. For such a time as this, has he called you to be sons and daughters of the living God? Celebrate the time that you live in, the opportunity that you have to reach others with the love of God and to show people how to love God like you love him as well. There's a frustration there because we know that God has put eternity in our hearts and sometimes we can't see the beginning from the end. We just have to be satisfied with what God has given us in the here and now. But knowing the reality that that frustration is a reality of this, there's something more to this life than what we experience in the here and now. We have eternity to come with a Father who loves us, cherishes us as children, and wants the best for us. Amen? Amen. Shall we stand? Hi, thanks for watching or listening to this message from New Life Church Rugby. If you're wanting to find out more about becoming a Christian or you're just looking for a new church, we'd love to have you visit us. Our services take place at 10.30 on Sunday mornings at our building on Railway Terrace in Rugby. And you can find out more details at newliferugby.com. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram or subscribe to our YouTube channel for more video content.